tonight an unprecedented step. Donald Trump meets Kim Jong-un on his home turf to restart talks. But is it a breakthrough or... Tonight, an unprecedented step. Donald Trump meets Kim Jong-un on his home turf to restart talks. But is it a breakthrough or just a photo op? Suspected tornadoes tear through a Saskatchewan campground in the middle of a long weekend. What the storm left behind. How does that make you feel? I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty worried about the future. And a new CBC poll finds widespread anxiety ahead of the federal election. So, what's keeping Canadians up at night? This is The National. Since the end of the Korean War, no sitting U.S. president had ever set foot in North Korea. But Donald Trump demonstrated yet again he is willing and able to go where other U.S. presidents have not. He crossed the border to shake the hand of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Kim called it a courageous act. Trump called it a big moment. Critics called it an empty photo op with a nuclear-armed dictator. But it may have relaunched U.S. diplomacy with North Korea. Ellen Morrow takes us through a chaotic day. Kim Jong-un, through an interpreter, greeted President Trump with apparent surprise. I've never expected to meet you at this place. And then, seconds later, President Trump took a step into history. But will the first visit of a sitting U.S. president to North Korea be a step to anything else? We'll see what can happen. Now we'll just see if we can do something. But again, uh, we want to get it right. We don't want to, we're not looking for speed. We're looking to get it right. A meeting that normally would have taken months of preparation was seemingly spurred by an impromptu Twitter invite from President Trump. The planning so haphazard, the new White House press secretary pushed North Korean guards aside for U.S. photographers to get through. It's just an honor to be with you. The president seemed eager to see Kim despite two previous summits and no plan for North Korea to scrap its nuclear program. This president has uh, raised the profile of a dictator like Kim Jong-un uh, and now three times uh, visited with him unsuccessfully. We haven't gotten anything out of it. And since the last meeting in February, analysts say North Korea has continued work on its nuclear arsenal. Still, the U.S. is hopeful for a turnaround. The president, uh, by getting together with Chairman Kim today, broke through and was able to get us the opportunity to get back to the negotiating table. But a deal, if the U.S. demand remains complete denuclearization, may prove impossible. I do believe that uh, they want to keep their uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, it's all about regime survival. Quite honestly, I'm not sure what Trump's aim is. I'm not sure if he knows. For now, today was about show. Substance may come later, perhaps in another meeting. President Trump invited Kim Jong-un to the White House. Ellen Morrow, CBC News. Washington. Now, as Ellen mentioned, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un's high-profile handshake may be unusual and, yes, historic. But away from TV cameras, North Korea's nuclear program continues. Officials and experts say North Korea is still enriching nuclear fuel. According to one report, over the course of 2018, even as Trump's diplomacy with Kim continued, Pyongyang produced enough material for up to seven additional warheads. But this you is... acknowledge they haven't even agreed to denuclearize. No, no, they have not. And agreed. there's no exactly. expiration date on this offer to continue to negotiate. And North Korea's commitment to halt missile testing? Well, it launched short range missiles into the sea last month. Trump officials have insisted they want full denuclearization. There's been no wavering on that, right? No wavering. But some see Trump's willingness today to meet Kim where he is as evidence he might accept a less ambitious deal. Now, earlier tonight, the White House posted a video on Twitter about the latest Trump-Kim summit.
set to a soaring soundtrack. It depicts Donald Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un in a decidedly heroic light. Among critics, the concern is that Trump has handed a propaganda victory to Kim. North Korean state media aired extensive footage of the summit in Singapore, set to its own soundtrack. But in this case, the Trump White House may have beaten them to the punch. Okay, back here at home on this Canada Day long weekend. Many are enjoying the great outdoors, but in northern Saskatchewan, two suspected tornadoes really tore things up. Holy This man and his family were among dozens caught in a powerful storm that just ripped through their campground. Winds estimated at more than 100 kilometers an hour left a trail of destruction. Trailers smashed, vehicles flipped over, trees flattened. There were several injuries, but thankfully no one died. Now it all happened in Meadow Lake Provincial Park, which is a, a popular getaway a few hours drive northwest of Saskatoon. Environment Canada is sending a team to confirm if these were, in fact, tornadoes. Jason Warwick went for a close-up look of his own, and he did speak with some of those who made it through the storm. I just want to get home. Tamara Gashi and dozens of others spent the day waiting outside their campground, hoping to collect whatever belongings they have left. There's one over there, too. There's two. There's one over here, you guys. There's two. There's one there and one there. Gashi and her family were inside their camper when the storm suddenly hit Saturday afternoon. She says baseball-sized hail pounded their camper. Josh looked out the window and saw the trees starting to topple over and turned around and yelled, get in the bunk and get down. And just like that, within about a second, we were rolling in our camper and we rolled probably three or four times. The camper was lifted in the air, crashing down 30 meters away. I don't know what hit me. I was trying to cover up my daughter and uh, it hit me and then scared scared me because all the blood was running off of me onto my daughter and thought it was her that was severely hurt. Ended up taking a chainsaw to the roof of the camper so we could all get out. Officials ordered everyone out of the park immediately and declared an emergency. CBC News got a tour of the devastation. Thousands of trees were uprooted or toppled onto the roads, onto campers, trucks, and even the local ice cream shop. Crews worked to survey the damage and to clear a safe path in for campers. In the aftermath of the storm, a female hiker was unaccounted for, and helicopters searched for her overhead. Today, she was found safe. At least three people were sent to hospital as a result of the storm, but all are expected to be okay. As for cleanup, officials say that's going to take some time. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Meadow Lake Provincial Park, Saskatchewan. Another right whale is in trouble in the Gulf of St. Lawrence tonight. It's tangled in fishing net and can't get free. In recent days, six right whales have died and other whales have been injured in the same region. But as you'll see, for all the concern about right whales in the east, there was also a very close call for orcas in the west. Anita Bath puts it all together for us. Just missing a pod of orcas, a boat speeds through the waters off Vancouver Stanley Park. Lots of people were uh, shouting or yelling, hey, these guys should stop, these guys should stop. Antonio Hurtado Cull shot this video and says he still can't believe it. You are supposed to uh, completely turn off your boat and start, uh, I mean, even with the engine off or the engine at idle. And you have to give room to the orcas, right? So it's, uh, it's just not acceptable to not to stop. Elsewhere in the country, whales are having other troubling tangles with people. Six North Atlantic right whales have died recently, and a necropsy performed on one shows it may have collided with a boat. And it appears that we may be up for another year of, of just terrible news. A ship strike is suspected in at least one other right whale death. The risk is that when the blades of that boat run over the backs, it'll slice them up like a razor blade turning at high speed. And it's not just boats themselves hurting Canada's beloved creatures. Tonight, there's another right whale in danger. A male spotted in the Gulf of St. Lawrence entangled in a fishing net. Researchers are waiting for better weather before trying to rescue him. Transport Canada has once again imposed speed restrictions in the western part of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, 10 knots for bigger boats. 
Experts say rules and regulations can help, but Canadians need to be educated about these critically endangered species before it's too late to save any of them. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. We are keeping a close eye on several developing stories tonight, starting with a deadly plane crash in Texas. The plane just crashed into the building here at Addison. It looked like it leered there. It was a private plane, burst into flames after slamming into an empty hangar minutes after takeoff. This was about 20 kilometers north of Dallas. All 10 people on board were killed. An investigation is underway. In Sudan today, at least seven people were killed, nearly 200 injured, according to government officials. This is unverified video emerged hours ago, appearing to show people fleeing gunfire. But on a day when protests swept across the country, what has been described as a massive show of strength for the democracy movement, as tens of thousands marched in the capital calling for civilian rule. Protesters and the military have been in a tense standoff since the country's longtime dictator, Omar al-Bashir, was forced out in April. A crackdown earlier this month killed dozens of protesters. This was another mass gathering in Hong Kong, but not the kind we've been seeing. An estimated 53,000 people came out to support the territory's police. Officers have been criticized for using tear gas and rubber bullets in a confrontation with demonstrators earlier this month. They were protesting legislation that would allow extradition to mainland China. It is Monday morning there now, and more protesters are gathering as a ceremony marks the anniversary of the 1997 handover of Hong Kong to China. I am the person most likely to negotiate a deal. Jeremy Hunt is looking to Canada as he campaigns to lead the UK. He's been talking to former Prime Minister Stephen Harper about helping with Brexit negotiations if Hunt wins the Tory leadership and becomes Britain's next Prime Minister. Harper tweeted that he's willing to help whomever wins that race, but he's not taking sides. A new poll for CBC News paints a grim picture of how Canadians are feeling ahead of this fall's federal election. There's climate change, health care, job security, political division, a lot to worry about these days. So CBC News teamed up with Public Square Research and Maru Blue. We surveyed more than 4,000 people this spring about what they want, what they fear, and the results were pretty stark. People feel underrepresented, divided, and just plain worried. Only about a quarter of Canadians feel optimistic. Money is a big concern. More than 80% of people say the cost of living is stressing them out. But even generally, more than half feel the country is on the wrong track. Tonight, we're launching our series, On Guard for Me, the Uneasy Canadian. So with the federal campaign looming, let's start with how Canadians feel about our leaders. Our poll suggests almost nine out of every 10 Canadians believe the only thing politicians care about is power. And almost half don't think any political party represents them. And as Salima Shivji explains, the way they behave seems to be turning people off even more. Oral questions. Questions oral. A pretty sight that quickly turns sour. with bickering and attacks punctuated by heckles. Order, I would of course order. The hyper-partisan back and forth is often enough to turn voters off politics completely. A cynicism revealed in the poll that's not exactly new. Order. Driven, some say increasingly, by those biting sound bites. How many times have you heard Someone say, if I behaved like that in my workplace, I'd be fired by 11 o'clock. And yet something happens when they walk into that chamber that they think it's okay. Or they think it works for news headlines. We train our politicians, give the response up front, and then give the explanation off the, you know, out the back because we know what will lead. The lead will be the eight words, the six words, and that will uh, be targeted to appeal to the group of people that we want to agree with us. For the Prime Minister, the poll suggests fewer people agree with him than in 2015. Sunny ways, my friends. 
sunny ways. The SNC-Lavalin affair, his trip to India, and a promise broken on electoral reform. All issues that are dragging his popularity down this time around. The problem with celebrity style campaigns is you go very, very high and then you drop like a rock um, when people realize that the celebrity vision of you, uh, that godlike vision, um, collapses. The disillusionment could benefit one party. A third of those polled are mulling, parking their vote with the Greens to send a message. There's no question that this is the most favorable circumstances that the Greens have ever experienced. What that cash is out in terms of actual votes and seats, it's hard to say. More options on the left that he says could also lead to more strategic voting and perhaps a more dispiriting and negative campaign this time around. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. So with Canadians feeling disconnected and disillusioned with politics, perhaps no surprise then, we've seen more support for populist sentiments. In fact, most of Canadians polled say the country is divided between elites and everyone else. Mike Crawley looks at what's driving that feeling. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. This summertime barbecue attracts a really big crowd. A cross-section of the six million people living in the greater Toronto area gathered at a fairground on a sunny afternoon. A diverse group with one thing that unites them, their support of Doug Ford. I'll tell you, unbelievable. <laughs> Ford became Premier of Ontario on a slogan he's tried to make his personal brand for the people. You are the only ones that matter to us. You are the only ones that we answer to, and that is the people of Ontario. <laughs> Ford taps into what appears to be a growing concern for many Canadian voters that the powerful don't care about them. In a poll commissioned by CBC News, people were asked about this statement. My country is divided between ordinary people and elites. Nearly 8 in 10 agreed. The 1% of like the most richest people, etc. And then there's a bigger population of people who aren't necessarily closer to the like um, elite. Ordinary people feeling divided and feeling um, kind of betrayed by the elite. The depth of the division surprises this pollster. There is a sense, and you see it throughout the poll, that Canadians um, feel they're left behind. And that is a, um, a concern. A concern in part because those who believe the country is divided are also more likely to be worried about their future. The average guy like you and I we're often forgotten or we're, we're, we're missed out in the process. As Canada heads toward the federal election, addressing this sense of division will be a crucial task for political leaders. They need to relate and understand the challenges that the mass population has in Canada, the anxieties that they have around job losses, um, affordability, growing in a, um, income inequality that exists between the elites and the masses. You are with us and that is all that matters, not the downtown insiders. Ford's anti-elite message resonates with the crowd at the fairground, mostly. Doug Ford is the premier, so he must be the elite, right? Mike Crawley, CBC News, Markham, Ontario. And a little later on The National, we will dig in a little deeper into some of the biggest concerns for Canadians, specifically the cost of living and jobs. But is all the anxiety really warranted? Plus, oh my God! Oh, a bike ride so through bad. Stanley Park in Vancouver leads to quite the show and a great escape. First though, a quick update from Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques, a glimpse at how he's doing less than a week after returning to Earth. He tweeted this photo out saying, an important milestone in my readaptation to gravity, carrying my daughter on my shoulders. Chernobyl is on fire. And every atom of uranium is like a bullet. One of the hottest series on TV this spring was based on the nuclear disaster at Chernobyl. Back in 86 with the real disaster, and again now, people are seeing the risks of nuclear power, from radioactive waste to meltdowns. 
But for some, nuclear power may be a solution to climate change. Tonight, as part of CBC's ongoing climate series, In Our Backyard, Jacqueline Hansen looks at how Canada is setting itself up as a world leader in a new nuclear age. This is where the, the, the heat is created. Terrestrial Energy hopes to design one of Canada's first small modular reactors, also known as SMRs. There is a recognition that incumbent technologies have had their day. SMRs are an evolved technology. In theory, SMRs are cheaper and smaller than conventional nuclear plants. They can be built in factories, then transported to replace diesel in remote communities that are off the grid. And like all nuclear, the reactors don't emit greenhouse gases. The federal government is setting Canada up to be a leader in SMRs. It's the next wave of innovation. It's the future of the Canadian nuclear sector. Nuclear power currently makes up about 15% of Canada's energy. There are already four large nuclear plants in operation, and billions of dollars are being spent in Ontario to keep some older nuclear reactors running longer. But globally, the share of nuclear has declined, as expensive traditional plants age and get shut down. That decline in nuclear is essentially cancelling out gains made by renewable energy sources and slowing down a shift to a more low-carbon energy mix, according to the International Energy Agency. We need nuclear and renewables because the, we are far, far behind our climate goals. Still, nuclear doesn't sit well with some, from concerns over radioactive waste to nuclear disasters. Go put it somewhere else. A group of First Nation chiefs from Ontario and Quebec believes the environmental cost could be too high. Here in Ontario, we're saying no. To, to small nuclear or radioactive, whatever size, we're saying no to it. No is no. Some of the fears about nuclear are often rooted in past accidents, from Three Mile Island to Chernobyl and Fukushima. What we found really surprised us. Yet some environmentalists have changed their minds about nuclear and its waste. It's just being monitored. There's not very much of it. By contrast, the waste that we don't control from energy production, we call it pollution, and it kills 7 million people a year, and it's threatening very serious levels of global warming. Terrestrial Energy is confident that once Canadians can see its technology in action, it will be able to change more minds. Advanced nuclear can deliver on the nuclear promise, which is enormous amounts of clean energy at a cost-competitive price. That's still about a decade away, a work in progress at this SMR company and many others that hope their nuclear technology can be part of the low-carbon solution to combat climate change that countries around the world are searching for. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Oakville, Ontario. And when we come back, an in-depth look at one of the biggest concerns for Canadians. Like, I don't feel like I even have time to think about what I'm worried about. <laughs> I don't have time to think ahead to the future because I'm so busy taking care of the now. We continue our series On Guard for Me, the Uneasy Canadian. Next. Tonight, we're exploring the results of a cross-country poll for CBC News gauging the mood of the nation. Earlier, we looked at a collapsing faith in politicians. Now, to the single biggest stress in Canadians' lives, the skyrocketing cost of living. 83% of Canadians are worried about just covering the basics, like groceries and monthly utility bills. More than half worry about not having enough money to retire. And about the same number worry about covering rent, never mind being able to buy a home. That anxiety is especially strong in a big city like Toronto, which has become so expensive, lots of folks have just given up and left. But as Joanna Rumiliotis discovered, the rising cost of living is not far behind. As a new day begins, it seems for many Canadians, a sense of unease stirs too. A lurking, nagging worry, hard to pinpoint and hard to shake. The feeling that life is stalled, even when it appears to be moving right along. It's a 12 hour day. So I walk out the door at 7 a.m., I come home by 7 o'clock. Cheryl Post is 26 and just graduated with a diploma in advertising. She landed an internship at an agency in Toronto 
It's a great break, but means a grueling commute. Two hours each way. That's four hours every day. I didn't realize how much two hours would take out of my life, like on the end of a day. And now it's, <laughs> it's a lot of time. <laughs> At least we have a full table, which is nice. She's and not exactly school, living like, large in Hamilton. Like, the toilet is under the stairs, which is a little weird. If you sit back too far, you might hit your head. <laughs> Her place is tiny, but at $1,100 a month, it's a relative steal. Yeah. So how much would this cost you in Toronto? Probably at least two grand. Way more than she can afford, because that's her entire monthly pay. We have a lot of bagels. I don't have time in the morning to eat them. <laughs> With skyrocketing rents and rising home prices in cities like Toronto, Finding an affordable place to live is a top concern for young Canadians. Cheryl and her partner are careful to eat in and take lunches to work. But even with all their budgeting, it's a lot of work just to get by in Hamilton, let alone get anywhere closer to where they want to be. I'm definitely worried that I won't buy a home one day. I think there's a good chance that it just might not happen considering how expensive it is in Toronto and Vancouver, the places that my job would need me to be. It's hard to be optimistic when you can't picture the future. Every time Cheryl goes to work, she dreams of having it all, a career, a family, a home. But like so many young people like her, she can't really see it. Like, I don't feel like I even have time to think about what I'm worried about. <laughs> I don't have time to think ahead to the future because I'm so busy taking care of the now. Moving further and further away from the city, more families are resigning themselves to the fact a long commute is the trade-off for a place to call home. Hello. Oh. Josh Newbar and Chelsea Kirkby spent years renting in Toronto before moving to Hamilton too. Rents were spiking and they were afraid of being edged out. We weren't in a position to buy a home in Toronto, which we were fine with as long as we could rent a place, but then rent suddenly was another, another issue. Not only were prices going up, but it was people were, were being very competitive with renting. Suddenly you had to wait in line and overbid for renting, and it just became a really competitive environment. So that's a lot of uncertainty when you have two kids. Look, Mommy, it fits perfectly. What they could afford is a down payment for a house in Hamilton. Very nice. They have a more secure sense of home, at least for now. Are those Cucumber roots? They might be. I don't think so, though. We're doing okay when we get our paychecks. <laughs> and I think that's the big thing, is that when you know that you have, uh, when you can plan, when you know you have a certain amount of money coming every month, then you're like, okay, we're fine because we know we are getting this in the future. But I think that the problem is if that ever ended, we'd definitely be like, okay, now we're not fine and we need to figure out how we can, um, how we can make ends meet if someone were to, were to lose a job. How does that make you feel? Worried. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty worried about the future for, um, yeah, just the, the job climate and making sure that we actually have uh, security in the future. So you pick your spot. There it is again, okay. that vulnerability, even for families who seem to be doing okay. Pat it down. Josh works as an urban planning consultant. Chelsea is in public health. Good jobs, as long as they have them. Job security keeps many Canadians up at night because so many feel, even if they made it this far, they can't afford to exhale. The way that our parents' generations lived, each of those elements of that kind of being chipped away piece by piece, whether it's the expectation of what a, what a degree gets you, whether or not you can own a home or have a rent a place with security, you know, what your salary might be, how long you'll stay at a job. There's just a lot of different things that are different now than they, than they used to be. If retirement is the ultimate target, it seems to be more distant than ever before. The daily commute, the daily grind. The majority of Canadians worry they won't be stopping it anytime soon. <laughs> Cheryl Luzado's son just graduated with a degree in graphic design. Uh, sweep your hair back. And is a makeup artist. She and her husband also have a daughter starting university. They're supporting them financially, and that makes it harder to save for retirement. These are the years in which you build up all of your reserves, but at the same time, you're kind of depleting them through, um, you know, paying for university and all sorts of other things as well. Hi, everyone. Hello. The majority of Canadians looking at middle age are concerned about what lays ahead. Cheryl is almost 50 and works as a health systems analyst. 
She sees herself working for at least another decade, maybe two, because she loves what she does and because she has to. My husband is a few years from retirement, which means that in a few years' time, I will be the only uh, income earner. And so certainly for us, it is about our kids making sure that they go through university and land on their feet. They're not, uh, they're not riddled with debt. They can begin their lives, uh, you know, without worrying about that. It means, like so many others, she can't set a date to retire. So she keeps pressing forward with a lingering unease following right behind her. Joanna Rumaliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Now, whether it's not being able to retire or not being able to find a good job in the first place, the poll results are pretty clear. Canadians are stressed about work. But as Peter Armstrong explains, it's not all bad news out there. For all that discontent the survey finds, and there is a lot, there's a disconnect too. The economy is actually doing pretty well. Remember, all these bits of economic data are really just you and your friends, and neighbors. Right now, in spite of all that anxiety, the data is painting a pretty good picture. Jobs are being added in droves, and a lot of those jobs are high paying tech and financial services jobs. In fact, over the last decade or so, where we've seen this kind of restructuring away from high paid manufacturing jobs, we've seen almost as many jobs created in this, uh, in this segment of the economy. That's not to say concerns are unfounded. In spite of record job growth, Canadian GDP has struggled to break out. The oil patch has yet to regain its footing. Businesses still aren't spending. GDP growth is finally showing some signs of life, but the fact is 2% growth is about the best we can expect for the foreseeable future. For more than a decade, consumers carried the brunt of the Canadian economy on their backs. Now, new mortgage rules and slightly higher interest rates are squeezing those consumers. So it's no surprise Canadians see an affordability crisis in housing and childcare. What's worse, there's no easy or obvious policy solution at hand. In Canada, we have this additional challenge that we don't have a singular economy. In fact, the economy is and feels different depending on which province you're in. We have the energy patch. We have uh, urban areas that are being driven predominantly by housing activity. So economic anxiety becomes amplified by global oil prices and international trade tensions, neither of which get sorted out in Canada, but both feed into the notion that the economy is struggling, no matter what the data say. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. And do stay with us this week for more in our special series, On Guard for Me, the Uneasy Canadian, as we continue to look through the poll results to see what Canadians are feeling out there, including new Canadians whose outlook is a bit brighter. We have everything we need here. We have the, the electricity, it's a safe country. Kayla Hounsell will explore why those new to Canada are usually more optimistic and trust the government to do the right thing, even if life isn't totally perfect. We'll also look at changing views on accepting refugees, plus how Indigenous people feel about the Prime Minister, four years after his promise to reset the relationship. Those stories this week on The National. And tomorrow, make sure you tune in starting at 11 a.m. Eastern. Rosie and I are going to be co-hosting the Canada Day special from Parliament Hill. It's going to be so much fun, so I hope you tune in. You can watch on CBC Television, CBC News Network, GEM, and online. Okay, we do still have a lot more ahead on tonight's show, including this. How are you finding time for all of this? It's very hard to balance. Um... It's, it's really difficult to balance with school and we're in a crisis. We're trying to like save the future of civilization and my math mark just doesn't feel very like relevant. <laughs> she is 16 years old, fiercely fighting climate change and desperately trying to get the world to listen. But first, New York City hit peak pride today as the World Pride host capped off a month of celebrations. I am very happy to celebrate these 50 years of the liberation. In the place where the Pride Parade was born, today the party stretched right down Fifth Avenue. Happy Pride! This is 
is my first part of it. It's my first time in New York. So. Have you ever had this much glitter on? I never have. This is actually his idea, so I, I just went along with it. It was great. About 150,000 people marching in 677 groups. Add to that all the people watching from around the world. Out of the closet and into the streets. It is awesome to be here and like seeing what the people before us like fought for so long. New York is hosting World Pride because it was here that the Stonewall Uprising pushed the gay rights movement into the spotlight. 50 years later, this was the biggest parade, but not the only one. Similar scenes in San Francisco, Seattle, and Chicago. But underscoring just how far the fight for respect and equality has to go, this scene in Istanbul today. Police used rubber bullets and tear gas to disperse the crowd at a Pride event after having banned the march for the fifth year in a row. A reminder of why, for many, protest is at the heart of Pride. This is a scene on repeat in Canada right now. Teenagers taking to the streets, worried about climate change and demanding to be heard. Their message, the world will suffer if we do nothing. But in the crowds, there was one particular person who caught our eye, a 16-year-old from Vancouver who's committed everything to the cause, and she has thousands of peers following her example. As part of CBC's deep dive on climate change called In Our Backyard, Allow me to introduce you to Rebecca Hamilton. We're rising and we're not going to stop rising until climate is treated like the emergency that it is because it's our future that is on the line. The emissions that we're producing are, are literally killing people in other parts of the world. I'm scared for the sea levels to rise and increase conflict and droughts and what is the end like this is just gonna keep going if we don't do anything i'm doing um everything i can to contribute to this movement to stop the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced the thing you have to understand about rebecca hamilton is that she's not just being dramatic she really sees this as the fight of her life now we're gonna march back to vancouver our gallery where we're gonna hear more and for all the reasons you might think she's just another teenager, know this, all these people you see here, Rebecca's the one who got the ball rolling. This is a climate strike. They've been happening every month, like clockwork. Students taking over the streets of Vancouver, trying to push the grown-ups into making climate change a priority. System change, not climate change. If BC isn't gonna take the action needed to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming, who is? System change, not climate change. The very first one Rebecca organized, inspired by an activist even younger than her. You've heard the name Greta Thunberg? Thank you for, for setting up some time. She's the young girl who at 15 began protesting outside the Swedish parliament, one day on strike every week. Rebecca, like Greta, just another normal kid trying to change the world. So a motion was put forward to get the city to write letters. It's Friday afternoon. After a flurry of exams, school is out, but and there's so still work to do to and always right. new people to bring into the fold. Yeah, I'm, okay. Owen. I'm new to this organization. I'm Everyone's so input matters. And those green circles you've been seeing Rebecca wear, symbolic of that sense of community, its connection to nature, and even the shape of the planet itself. For Rebecca, most of her free time is dedicated to the cause. We say we're a nonpartisan organization, but our existence is like inherently political and partisan. She has a network, other teens across the country, like-minded and urgently wanting to roll up their sleeves. What we need to ensure is that places where strikes need to happen. Every day, they plan their next moves, all sites set on the federal election in October. And they've come a long way. Do you remember how that first strike went? Yeah, um, so I brought a bunch of people together um, across Vancouver and we just came together and started organizing and it was really exciting. None of us knew what we were doing. Um, we were like, okay, so we want to do this action. We want to like get media there. We want to have a bunch of youth, but like, what do we do now? 
Turns out, organizing a movement is a bit like a dog chasing a moving vehicle. Feels impossible, and even if you catch up, then what? In Rebecca's case, that moving vehicle is full of grown-ups. They can say, like, yes, I support you. A lot of these conversations we have with adults um, and politicians, they come back to that, to this concept of, like, what's realistic? And they say, like, yes, we recognize that this is a big problem, but we need to be realistic if we want to take any action. Being loud doesn't guarantee being heard. So today, Rebecca's trying to refine the message. She's come to Greenpeace for help. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Come on in. How's things? Good. Did you just almost fall? It's crystallizing these things into a demand. And like, what's the demand? Actually, this is a problem we have. It's hard to balance like being cool to the youth, while also like being palatable to the adults and how much we should be, mm. you know? Yeah. We were thinking of like trying to set up workshops or something to teach kids like how to talk to their parents about climate change. <laughs> Cute. How to have the talk. <laughs> it's about, I could just see that as a line. It's about to get existential. <laughs> There's a moment when I recognize that literally nothing else matters if our planet can't support life. That it's really useless to have dreams for the future and that all the progress we've made as humanity and as a civilization will be for naught if um, our world continues to descend into ever-increasing chaos because of climate. You're a student, too. In theory, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How are you finding time for all of this? It's very hard to balance. Um, it's, it's really difficult to balance with school. And we're in a crisis. We're trying to like save the future of civilization. And my math mark just doesn't feel very like relevant. And so it's really difficult. It's very frustrating. So do you know how long your test is tomorrow? Nope. Like an hour and 10 minutes or so. It's not just frustrating for Rebecca either. That much you can read on her mom, Carolyn's face. She worries Rebecca may be sacrificing more than just her math mark, that this fight has become her entire life. It's very frustrating for me, and of course I feel bad then that I'm sort of getting angry and frustrated over that, and I would not want her having any regrets. I think this is, as she calls it, the movement of her generation. Are you ready? The task is immense. They are trying to save the world. But every footstep is proof progress is possible. Minds can be changed. And so the plan from here, keep ramping up until the grown-ups finally start listening. For the record, I do hope the math mark works out. But either way, I think she's going to be OK. When we come back, a cat and mouse game in the water. Those orcas are on the hunt. The ending, though, well, let's just say it's worthy of tonight's moment. Orca spottings happen in BC fairly regularly. Same goes for seals, but the two interacting, well, that's a bit more rare. A woman named Friba Rezaei pulled over to the side of the road while biking with some friends yesterday morning and caught the show of a lifetime happening right off Vancouver Stanley Park. And that is tonight's moment. We went uh, to Stanley Park for a bike ride, me and my two friends. And then I saw a sound coming like out of the ocean. There were three, uh, three whales, there were three adults, and there were two babies. And we stopped there to watch. For me, it was my first time seeing orca whales so close and in action. And then I noticed that uh, they were chasing the seal. He was fighting for his life, and uh, the orcas were circling the, uh, the seal. They chased the seal around a little bit, and the seal managed to skip. Oh, oh here's the seal! Oh my God. Because the um, seals have very good camouflage, they could hide very well among other rocks, and that's how the seal got away. And I saw this seal stood there for a few seconds, and uh, the orcas could not see it anymore, and then went back to the ocean on the safer part. It was just amazing. I cannot put into words how I felt. Gotta love a good uh, underdog story. Okay, um, two things before I let you go. One, I hope you're having a great Canada Day long weekend. And the second thing is I hope you will join 
Rosie and I uh, tomorrow on Canada Day proper because the two of us are going to be broadcasting live from Parliament Hill in Ottawa. That's from 11 a.m. Eastern to 2 p.m. Eastern. You can watch on CBC Television, CBC News Network, CBC Gem, and uh, online otherwise. So I hope you have a great weekend and I hope you tune in. That's The National for this June 30th. Have a great night.